It is a great honor and a privilege to introduce Naomi Waldman. Your maiden name was Izbuski. And Naomi, you were born in... Antwerp. In what year were you born? <coughs> 29, 1929. So if you could tell us a little bit about your upbringing and your family. Um, I was the youngest one from six children. And I was uh, very spoiled. <coughs> uh, my, uh, you know, I was like a toy in the house, I imagine. That's what I was told I was, when I was a baby. And uh, I have uh, two sisters older than me. Uh, and then I have uh, three brothers. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so uh, we were six children. And what do you, uh, you ask me questions? And I can I just say. ask, your, your parents came from, from, from Poland? They came from Bialystok. And my father was from a little town near Bialystok, Orel. And my mother was from Bialystok. She, she was one daughter and with, with the six brothers. And uh, they came to Antwerp. Uh, the end of, I think, by 1900, in the 1900s. And... Uh, <coughs> And uh, they married there. My father and my mother married there in Antwerp. You have a picture yeah, of the. Yeah. This is. I think this is a picture from my parents where they were engaged. I think, which is in, very interesting here on this picture, um, that in these times the man was sitting down, and the woman was standing. <laughs> yeah, that's not the. <laughs> That's not what it is today. It's a beautiful picture. Yeah. And your parents, were they both very religious? Uh, yeah, my father was more religious even than my mother. <coughs> and, and, yeah. You put it. You can put it here. Um, this is not in the, in the movie. But your father came from a very orthodox... Yeah, very orthodox. And he put out to fill in every day? He yeah, sure. Fill in everything. It was very orthodox. We, we had to wash our hands be, be, when we got up. When we got up in the morning, we had to Nägelwasser, that is the call, and the makeup Roche and everything. And he was a very religious man. And why did they come to Belgium? Why did they come I to I think Africa? they had some family there. You know, they had pogroms there in Bialystok and it was terrible for the Jews for a change. <laughs> when, when is it not? Anyway, so they came to Belgium and they um, stayed, they worked in Belgium. They got in the diamond business. And your father was involved in the diamonds as well? Yeah, he was involved, but he was he was not a businessman really. He should have been a teacher. He was a Malamed and he, yeah, he should have been a teacher and he, were, he didn't have this, you know, very, very straight man. He was not a businessman. So, but they took him into the business, in the diamond business, and um, my all my my uncles, my mother's brother, they became all very wealthy. Um, my father, he struggled rather, you know. Um, and, but we had a nice life. We didn't know we were not well off. I mean, financially, but we didn't feel it as children, you know. There was a lot of warmth in the house and uh, family minded and... Now before you were born, your parents went to England for a while? No, um, my parents, yeah, before I was born, my parents in the First World War, they left Belgium and they went to England because of the war. And uh, <coughs> their uh, three, uh, two brothers were born there in England, the two older ones. And, uh, but after the war, they went back to Belgium. And then uh, we were born there, two sisters and myself, um, and one brother. Uh, <coughs> and uh, that's where we lived. And Nami, what were your, your siblings' names? Oh, <laughs> my oldest brother was Abraham, and Joseph, and David, and my sisters were Rachel, Eva and me. And can I ask, what is your earliest memories growing up? What do you, re what do you recall? Uh, I remember that I had one little doll. I was, must have been three years old. 
without clothes, and that was my, my toys. It was not like today with the hundreds of toys, and, you know. And that was my toy, and I loved, I loved always, I loved babies, I loved to play with it. And, <coughs> and when <coughs> many years later, <coughs> one of my birthdays here in Israel, going fast forward, uh, I don't remember how old I was then, but they made a party for me, my grandchildren, and my children and great grandchildren, and they made, they gave me like, for every year of my life, what I didn't have, they gave me. So when I was three years old, I didn't have it. So they bought me a beautiful big doll. It's, it's there, I have it there, <laughs> with clothes on and everything. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, when I remember, it was, uh, I had a nice family life, but I didn't, uh, then school started, I went to first grade, and I didn't like school. A school, was it a public school? Public school, yeah. At that time, they didn't have yeshivas for girls. I went to public school, and um, what was pretty uh, awful, that in, in first or second grade, I think, uh, uh, they were Jewish girl and not Jewish girl. We always kept apart. At the recess, the recess hour, they played with their, their own, and we played between us. And uh, the teacher, uh, she, she uh, when she called the children to come to the board for some reason, so she used to call the non-Jewish girls, uh, Denise, Monique, uh, you know, their name, and she called to the Jewish girl, Izbuski, Yakubovich. You know, this was very, very painful at such an early, early age. So we hated the Goyim, really had a hate for them, I remember as a child. And, um, and all kinds of little things. Uh, we had a cleaning girl and uh, she was cleaning the photos on the, on the walls. And I had a photo of my grandfather, my mother's father, beautiful, uh, not a photo, a, a, a piece of art with by pencil, done by pencil. And uh, she was here and she, she took it off and then she hung it back upside down. This was already dead. And do you remember going to Shul? To yeah, to yeah, my family we went to Shul. In Belgium at that time, women we went to Shul only on, you know, on the holidays. Uh, not every week. My father went to shul every week. My brothers, some of them, and some of them not. And um, and um, it was a nice, nice uh, life at a certain, you know, time of my years. Now, when when Hitler came to power, I was ten years old. Do you remember? Yeah, I remember everything. I was ten years old, and they. Um, we uh, had we had <coughs> rented a little apartment next to the next to the uh, border, France. It's called La Panne, and to be able to flee Belgium, but naturally nobody could go through. They didn't let you through. Um, they uh, let through my brother. Was he was uh, he was already a young man of uh, I don't know 18, 19. Uh, and he had an English passport and he could just go and be free. But he didn't want to leave the family, so he stayed. Uh, another brother lived in London at that time, so he was like safe. My third brother, he was born in Belgium and he was a big, big Zionist. And he wanted to go to Eretz Israel, I mean to Palestine at the time. And uh, what he did, at 18 he enlisted in the, in the Belgium army just to learn how to shoot and how to fight. So he would go to, to uh, Palestine after the war and he would fight for the Jews. And this is what he did. Unbelievable. So, um, so then, and, so that's, and we, the three girls with the parents who were stuck in Belgium, we were hiding. We were living in a in a abandoned house with a cousin of my mother, and she was a Belgium citizen at the time. They didn't, um, you know, deport Belgium citizens. So <coughs> the shutters were closed, and people didn't know we were there, living there. So 
going, uh, yeah, what else you want to know? So, I'm losing my... So what happened when the war started and you were in this town? Oh, yeah. So what happened, uh, so we went to La Palme, to that little apartment, and they announced that it's going, they were going to have a lot, a lot of heavy bombardment on Belgium. So uh, that house where we lived was like a tiny little house, you know. This was nothing major to protect us. So uh, people decided to go to the basement of a church, uh, which was a, a tremendous big, two, with two steeples. Um, and my father, he wouldn't walk into a church. He says, Hashem will help me wherever I am. And he stayed in the apartment. So my mother and my one of my brothers, the brother that Joseph was his name, and uh, he was born in England, he came with us, and my two sisters and me and my mother. <coughs> so uh, night came on, you know, it got a little darker, and we heard the, the planes zooming above our heads, and then suddenly the bombardment started, and everybody was petrified and saying, Tell them. I think there were non-Jewish people also there, I don't know. But my brother said to Hillel and I, the only thing that I could remember was a Mosi. So I kept on saying the Mosi. That's the story from the Mosi, who came a very long way. It's amazing. And uh, we survived. My uh, do you, re you remember Hamotzi? What? You remember the bracha? Yeah. I should say the bracha. <laughs> So many times, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Amot Silechem Mina Oros. Amen. Amen. You kept on saying it over and over. Yeah, I kept on saying it. I said Hashem, not Adonai. <laughs> um, and I kept on repeating it again and again and again. So that mostly became very interesting, I thought. Never thought of. In 1991, in New York, in the Marriott Marquis, uh, we had an assembly from hidden children. What happened then, after the war, people didn't talk about hidden children. They, they didn't go to anything. But, uh, so they only talked about the uh, people who were in camps. And the one woman she, woman, she said she had a very hard time being a hidden, ch a hidden child, whatever. She said, we have to say something to her. So she organized it, and it became a very big uh, organization, the hidden children. And people, and we had a, a, a get-together in the in Marriott Marquis with sending out invitations and everything, and I was on the committee. And uh, <clears throat> 1,600 people came from all over the world, yeah, who had immigrated many places. And uh, so that became a big to-do. So one of the f women on the, um, at the, um, um, I, One of the organizers. Yeah, the organizers. She said, you know, Naomi, you should say the mozi at the dinner. So right away it triggered off something in my mind and I said, oh my God, I can't believe it. So I made a little story with her and I got up there and I spoke in front of 1,600 people. I have even seen that I talked and I said, uh, and I said the mozi. And I had never spoken in front of people. I was like a nervous wreck. <laughs> But Nami, what's amazing is that, and I think you, you mentioned this, that just as the, the, the bread, it's, it's underneath the ground, the, the flour. And yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you were all, it's hidden, and then it, you were yeah. also hidden. Yeah. There's a lot of symbolism, there's a lot of... That's right. So my, my son helped me a lot, bringing all these things up. Uh, but before, did you ever think, did you remember that you had said Hamotzi, because then actually your whole family was saved, and you were saved from the bombs. Yeah, we, we, are, we are saved from the bombs, but we were saved also in different, different situations that happened, not only the Hamotzi saved us. It was a mess. Really. And I think the one steeple was bombed in yeah, the Yeah, one steeple was bombed and the other one was fine, we were sitting under the steeple that was not bombed, and uh, we all survived. Um, and so did my father, sitting at home. It's a miracle. It's a, mi it's a miracle, yeah. So, so many miracles. And a miracle that I'm sitting here and talking to you. That's so true. <laughs> and then from there, what happened after the, you left the monastery? Then we went back to um, Antwerp. And over there we, uh, we went to this house. I remember the address, everything. 
Do you remember it now? Yeah, yeah. It was in the <coughs> the Leeskafstraat, not the Leeskafstraat. It's where we in the Leeskafstraat, number 29. Uh, and this was, and so we lived there. And my, my, I was, you know, I was very blonde and I didn't look Jewish, so I went out here to buy things. My parents never left the house. And we had, the <coughs> we had like a courtyard in the back. And one day the door was open for some reason, and we had some neighbors, and they saw my father in sitting in the courtyard, and he used to wear such a big tipa, a round one, you know, that stood up a little bit. So, uh, and they denounced us. They informed. They informed, yeah, they informed. So. Uh, At this uh, time, did you have to wear the yellow star? Yeah, yeah. My, well, I never went out, so I didn't wear the yellow star, but my sisters wore it. And they walked around. So one day they got, we got a note from the Judenrat, you know, they had a Judenrat, in other words, those Jews were doing things that the Germans, you know, didn't want to do, about getting people together uh, and sending them off to Auschwitz. So they got a, a, a letter that they have to come and present themselves to the Judenrat. And, uh, oh no, this, this came first from my parents. My parents were supposed to, to come to the Judenrat. So this was going on all over Antwerp, all over. So my sister said, that's not possible, they're two old people. They probably taught us, the two sisters. So they went to the Judenrat and I said, you made, they made a mistake. Those are my parents, they can't work and they're, they're not, you know. At this, in those years when you were 60, you were old. So it's probably us. So they said, okay, so you go. So my two sisters went. And they ended up in Malin, Mechel, you heard about Mechel. And they worked there. They worked in the office. And this is what saved them to be there. And they were Belgian citizens. Oh, no, when they came there, when they came to present themselves, they said, this is a mistake. We are Belgian citizens. We're not supposed to be deported. We have to stay here. So this is why they let them stay in Mechel. Because from there they would transport on yeah, to the, the camps. To Auschwitz, yeah. yes. So they could stay there because they were Belgian citizens. And there were some other, other women and people. So, so they were there and we were in the house hiding. And uh, my brother, Joseph, who was English, he was sent, he was he sent to, uh, uh, um, it's called a prisoner of war, not as a Jew, as a prisoner of war in Germany, in a camp. So he was safe because he was British and he wasn't, you know, he wasn't considered a Jew by them. Mm -hmm. Even though he told this, this were non-Jews together with all uh, citizens in Jews. So they used to tell me, him or the Jews, tomorrow we're going to kill you, you know. This is how I lived for five years that affected very much his life. Anyway, so, um, so one day we heard, we heard noises from in the, the, around the corner from us, La Moniestra. We heard noises, they were getting people out of the houses. And people were crying and screaming. The Germans came to pick them up in trucks. And normally they were also Belgian, Belgian officials. Oh, the ones who came? Yeah, they were working with the Germans. I don't know the details, I just know they were coming for them, for us. And uh, so we had an attic in the house. So my parents and myself, we went up in the attic with a pail and some water, whatever. And there was a, uh, a um, yeah, there was a ladder going up to the attic, so he climbed the ladder and we pulled the ladder after us and we closed the trap, the trap, and we're sitting there in the attic, not breathing. All of a sudden we hear the Germans in the house coming and knocking on the door, raus, raus, you the raus, and they're banging on all the doors from the, from the rooms and screaming. And, and my, my uh, mother's cousin, she spoke very well German, and uh, she said, they are not here. They went away. They're not here. They're not in the house. 
we were living downstairs on the main floor. So, so they, all they had to do is just look up and see. It was like, a, you know, a, a board. I mean, like from a pa painting, like a border. Uh, a uh, how do you call this? A frame. A frame. It was a frame on the ceiling. So it looked like you know they they didn't notice it, and they left. And then my cousin says to us, she said, Feifel, that my father's name was Feifel, left. Come down, come on, they left. Oh my God, this has just happened now. <laughs> they, and they, and uh, they left, yeah, and, and, and then she says, come down, they left, the Germans left. You should. And we didn't want to come down, we were afraid that the Germans were standing behind her and, uh, you know, and getting a streak to come down. So finally she started to swear on her children and her husband and her this. So we came down. And she told, she told us that they said they're going to come back tonight. She took she a, such a chance to do this. If they would have found us, we would have all right away to Auschwitz, all of us. So that was really very brave of her to do that. Um, so, we, uh, so what do we do? We didn't know where to go. So my mother and her father was still alive and he was living in another street like four or five blocks away with his wife and he was very sick, he was old and sick and he had a big, uh, from the doctor, a big sign over his bed that he's not allowed to be moved. So he said we're going to go by my, by my father and sleep overnight, whatever. And so we come to, to the door and she comes down, the, the mother, she was a second wife. I know, I'll tell you why I'm saying that. She says, I can't let you in. He's so nervous, he's so jittery. I'm afraid of him. Don't, you can't come in. He's gonna see you, he's gonna be very nervous. We had no choice, we went back home. I'm just wondering if it would be if the hill mother for my mother. I don't know if she should, she would have done. But I'm not talking, I shouldn't have said that either. Anyway. So we went back home and we didn't get undressed. We lie down on our beds waiting for them to pick us up. This is our, this was the, 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 the problem of the Jews. We were like, we can't do nothing. We're just waiting for them to pick us up and take us out. Where if today, wow, we have an army. What a difference, that's a big difference. Even though it's terrible and it's scary and everything. But we were helpless. Totally helpless. We were totally completely helpless. helpless. At their mercy. At their mercy. Now here we're fighting for our lives, which is incredible. Um, so we sh they didn't come. They came six months later. They came. So you were hiding all yeah. that time? In that home, yeah. Six months later they came, and very early in the morning, and they're knocking at the door. Uh, my mother was still in bed. My father was in the living room uh, putting on his villain and then, and they burst into the apartments. They started to throw everything on the floor and the books and the frog and well and I ripped off my father's villain and uh, I said, Come on, get dressed, get dressed, we're going. It was a truck outside already with people in it from around the corner. And my father my, my, we had two daughters in Malin, so he wanted to say something to the guy. So he wanted, he was, he couldn't talk, he, 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 he couldn't talk uh, German. I mean, so the guy smacked his face. And you saw And this. I saw this. And I started to scream and to cry. And uh, so anyway, we got onto the truck. And on the truck, my father had a tiny little beard, like a uh, goatee, you know, a little white beard. He started to cut this off with a hand uh, uh, cutter, like it. and he cut it off. And all of a sudden, I see him without the beard. I'd never seen him without the beard, and I started to cry. Anyway, and he didn't say anything. What happened on, in the camp? He, the, the, he told me that why he did that because they said that the Germans ripped out the beards from the Jews. Uh, okay, so we came. We came in. We came into the, opened the port, the doors from the camp, 
and we enter the with the truck we enter into the to the camp and my two they were standing there waiting people and my two sisters see us coming and they get they became white like a sheet and they said to they went to the commander there they were already there maybe for seven eight months at the time and they said you know this are, these are my parents I mean they please give them some work to do so they won't be able they won't be shipped and they did my father and me we uh, folding cartons to put soap in uh, you know different soaps whatever and my mother was working on a sewing machine and and that's why and that we stayed we stayed there they didn't deport us and did you have six enough, months did you have enough food or was well the yeah was, it was like food soup you know soup and bread whatever and we we were not I don't remember being hungry and no did you know where they were deporting people no you just knew I knew they were going to work we never knew anything maybe I maybe I didn't know I was young you know so maybe my parents didn't tell me I don't know but I didn't know I didn't know that they were murdering people and burning people and all that I knew it was not good that's I know naturally scary <clears throat> so we worked and then at one point my, my father was a little you know you had to make a certain amount of cartons my father was a little shaky and uh, so I was fast and young and I was doing a, more than he did more than I needed and when the Germans didn't look I put part of mine on this pile so this is how we stayed there and um, you know and it was very uh, it was very tense naturally but I didn't feel that way so much I made a friend there in the court when we were in the court I made a friend a girl named uh, Helene Zilberschatz I remember her name and she had a radio name a transport number on her neck and she used to, her parents used to live with still free I don't know what happened to her parents and they used to send their little pa parcels with goodies and with uh, you know with uh, salami and everything and she used to share this with me and we were very friendly and then one day the, uh, we knew that there was going to be a transport the place was full and I said to her you know I'm so concerned about you she says ah she says, don't be concerned I'll be free before you she tells me and she jumped from the train and they killed her naturally she jumped and how old was she she was uh, two years older than me young so uh, it was awful um, so <clears throat> after six months being there uh, they announced that the uh, Belgium Queen Queen Elizabeth she's from Belgium uh, ordered the Germans to free all the Jews that were in the camp who were Belgium city Belgium citizen so my two sisters became free and somehow I don't know how it happened we, we went out with them no question asked my parents were Polish you know so I was Polish too because of them you had to be 16 years old to became Belgium citizens to opt so we, we got out with other people too and we were free that was 43 the war wasn't over yet so we went to Brussels and don't ask me where the money came from where we had, we had nothing we had nothing no money nothing how we got to Brussels I have, I have no idea we came to Brussels we figured Brussels is like a bigger town we'll be able to hide better so we took an apartment there don't ask me how, did, how we got the apartment and we had no money my two sisters went to work as maids by other people and I and my and my parents were there and uh, I don't know how much time passed by anyway one day uh, my sisters used to come home after the work and then go back in the morning um, after a while um, all of a sudden my sisters coming coming back with the Germans they got picked up where they worked so they come back with, with the Germans to, to pick us up 
So they took us to, um, it was 43, they took us to the Gestapo uh, headquarters in Brussels, Avenue Louise was the name of the street. And we came there and they put us in a jail, in a jail cell, where maybe a lot of people very squeezed together in a jail, in a cell, uh, cell with the bars, you know, like prisoners. And um, we had no idea what was going to happen with us. And um, so uh, I had to go to the bathroom. So they opened the door and the guard was standing there with a with the rifle. And he took me with a rifle accompanying me to the bathroom, like if I would be a criminal. And then when I was finished, he brought me back to the cell. That's, I, you know, remember that. And uh, so then finally we went up to the office and they made, they decided what to do with us. At that time they had a, a they had for a while a old age home in Brussels for Jews and it was known for, from the Germans. This is our old age homes and then children's homes, our orphanages, this is for the children. And I ended up in one of those children's homes and my parents ended up in old age home and my sisters were sent back to Mechelen. It's amazing that they never sent you there and they never sent yeah, your parents. Yeah. It's a miracle. Miracle. So uh, I went to Tiefenbrunner first for one week. I was there and it was so nice there. You know, he was a very nice guy. And um, after one week, they, was, they opened up another home because it was very small. Not many kids were there. And I was sent, there was one for the older ones, and I was sent in the other home in Esch en Refai, it was called, in Namur, with other kids. And I was crying, I was miserable there, and I wanted to go back to Stephen Brunner, but they wouldn't, I mean, I was, I was there. Um, so I was there maybe for a year, um, and it was interesting when I'm thinking now, I don't know how we survived financially, I must say, I remember now my brother, who was in Germany in, as, as, a, as a prisoner of war, he used to do the laundry from his inmates and make some money, and that money used to send us, my parents. You know, and somehow we communicated. We knew he was there, and they knew we were there. My, oh yeah, and my, I forgot about my brother, who was fighting the Germans. He ended up, he was in Cuba, he ended up in Cuba. My parents took a smuggler to smuggle him to Cuba because he had finished his service as a soldier. They were going to take them to, to fight, uh, you know, to fight. So he uh, ended up in Cuba. In Cuba, he uh, knew what was going on. Some, I, think, I don't know, my brother in England wrote to him in Cuba, the one from Cuba, and we had a communication between us. It was very un unusual, and uh, so uh, uh, so yeah. In Cuba, towards the end of the war, he said he enlisted in the in the Brigade Piron. That was a, a, a brigade, an English brigade Piron, that uh, a Piron, and he enlisted with another bunch of friends, uh, just uh, voluntarily. He didn't have to. And they sent them to Canada to train. And from Canada, they sent them to England. And from England, they came and they freed Belgium. And he's the one who came to, after the war, right in 47, he came, he married, and he came to Palestine. And now we can ask, when you were in the orphanage, did you manage, did your parents come and visit you? No, no nobody came to visit me. My sisters from the my sisters were working in other homes, as as uh, you know, with the children, with the younger children. I was I was I was I was my I was younger. So what I did, we, I I used to do. We used to have to mend uh, the uh, you know to sew and fix the clothing, and, uh, and in the kitchen to help peel the potatoes, whatever. And I was promoted to be, I was very proud of this, I was promoted to be the, the um, 
Uh, oh my God. The nurses help her. We had a nurse. So I worked with her. And kids were really getting hurt. They were running and I, they came to me and to her. We fixed it up, we cleaned it, and we put a bandage on. And I loved it so much, I came home. To, I said to my father, I want to become a nurse. <laughs> he says, that's not for a Jewish daughter. <laughs> and you went in the orphanage for about a year? Yeah, yeah. And during this time, did you make a lot of friends? or how did Yeah, I made friends, yes. I, we were five girls, five religious girls, because there were a lot of irreligious kids too. We were about the same age and we made a club from ourselves. The club of in Flemish, the club of five. And we, got, we were in touch for many years later. And but they're all really uh, not here anymore. Who was in charge of the orphanage? Who was in charge? Oh, a Jewish man, Horowitz, Mr. Horowitz. He was in charge, a very nice guy. And uh, they, they were monitors, Jewish, everything was Jewish. They, the Germans, and that's where I'm coming back to, the Germans said, we don't deport Jewish kids, we don't deport old people, look at the homes we're having. Look at the old age home. There was a, you know, a facade, I mean, like, showing that what they don't do, or humanitarians they are. I think also the Queen had a special Influence. Ag agreement that they wouldn't yeah. touch the, the orphanage and the... Oh, I don't know about that. They, they, she, she protected the Belgian citizens. And most of the Jews were not Belgian, or the older people, you know, they never, they never became Belgian, it's still Polish. <coughs> um, and during this time, when you were in the orphanage, did you get to meet your parents? Did you? No. For the whole year? The whole, no, I didn't see them. I didn't see them, I never went. They didn't allow to go out from the orphanage. And my sisters tried to come to me and visit me, but they couldn't do that either. I think once, once one of my sisters came. So did you know what was happening with your parents? You must have been... No, I knew that they were in the old age room. I knew. And I knew my sisters. I knew everything. But it must have been so difficult not to go visit, not to go... Oh. It, was a, it was also a danger to go out. Yeah, they pick you up in the street and you finish. And how many children were there in the orphanage? Oh, there were maybe, uh, I would say, 150. And then, three days, three, one week before the war was over, the, 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 this Mr. Horowitz, uh, you know, the one who took care of the home, said that he was advised, he was told that the Germans are coming to pick us up. The Germans are coming to pick us up, emptying the home. So what did he do? He dispersed us in villages around there by old people in, on farms. We were all put, put away. I was in a farmhouse with an old couple and they were very nice. They didn't even know I was Jewish. We were like war, orf war orphans. orphans. And um, they were very nice and uh, I slept in upstairs in a room one of those high beds at the time, with a big crucifix above my head. I talk about it when. And uh, I covered myself completely and I said, Shma. <laughs> um, so, so you couldn't see the crucifix and yeah, the crucifix couldn't, couldn't, couldn't see You couldn't see me, yeah. <laughs> and when you saw the family, they wanted to know your name and I think you... I said, Nicole. I, gave my, I understood that it was not the right thing to do, Naomi. And they wanted, to give you, what? they wanted to give you some bacon, I yeah. think, and you... I said I'm vegetarian. <laughs> they never knew you were Jewish? No, I don't think so. They're two old people on the farm. <sighs> anyway, that's... So. And then, uh, after 10 days, he came back, the... Uh, the um, uh, the... Uh, I lose, I lose my words. I don't know. It's awful. The director from Mr. The, Horowitz. Mr. Horowitz came back and to other people that were there uh, organizing, and they came back to pick us up from the in, in Jewish, and we went back to the home. Now in the home, most of the kids didn't have their parents or nothing, so uh, whoever had parents went went to their parents or to, to family, and the other ones well, they sent them to to Israel all these children that had nobody left. And how was the interaction when you saw your parents? Yeah, there was a, 
the interaction was very uh, emotional. emotional and very, uh, very upsetting too for me. I came there and I see these two old people, they looked very old to me, sitting there without, had nothing. And I hugged them and I kissed them naturally, I was so happy to see them. But I felt I had to go to the other room and start to cry, to the way they looked and the way they, they were destitute. They had nothing, I didn't know what was going to be. So my mother had brothers who were in America, who fled before, just before the war. And they were very well off, so they helped. They sent money. And now we can ask your sisters. They were in the in, in the transit in Michelin. They what? When you saw your sisters and your brothers there yeah. as well? Yeah, yeah. Well, little by little, we all got together. And you stayed all together? Not for too long. Well, one brother was in England. He didn't come back right away. He stayed there. Uh, my brother in. The, uh, came back from, from the camp there, yeah, Joseph, and uh, a very depressed man he was. You know, he's the one who was in, in, in as, a, as an English citizen, and uh, they used to tell him every day they're going to kill him. Not just him, but all the Jews there. He never married, <clears throat> and uh, very, very bright guy. Anyway, so... Uh, I don't remember being all of us together. I don't remember that. You know, everybody was worried. We had to, my two sisters uh, went to work, went, went back to school. I went back to school in Brussels. And uh, my sisters went to school and to work. And uh, my brother was getting married and moved to Palestine. And the school that you went back to, was it a public school? Public school, school yeah. And how did the how did you interact with the non-Jewish kids? Did they ask? You know what? what? I don't remember. I was there for two years. That's all. I had to go to work to help my parents. Did you have Jewish friends in the school? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I remember her name, Anna Tanzel. She lives in. in the, she was left alone. She had her parents. She was living with an aunt in Paris. I don't know what happened to her. Um, a sad story. You know, all these kids that were hidden had very, very sad stories. Uh, they, they were, first of all, they were very young. They were like two years, three years old. The, the, uh, the non-Jewish people became very much in love with them. They loved them. They wanted to adopt them. And uh, so all of a sudden, one of them, the mother came back from camp and she wanted her child back. So she, so the kid didn't want to go didn't want to go because she didn't know her mother. Such a very sad, terrible things. So they kidnapped her, that girl. And uh, they kidnapped her and, and she uh, <clears throat> was so miserable with her mother. She hated her mother. She couldn't smell her. She couldn't stand her. And this was, and then she, she grew up somehow. And she was also on the committee in '91 from the kind, from the hidden children. And you knew her well. I knew her. I knew her. Yeah. And she was very. She couldn't. She couldn't stay in. She couldn't have a, a place where she lives. She lived in a in an apartment or something with a with two valises, two suitcases. You know, like always ready to go. <coughs> and you know, more other things. A lot of uh, terrible. Do you, do you remember her name? Um, her name it was one. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember. Mia. One. I remember one name. Mia. She. Uh, she was married to a doctor, and and this doctor was never home, and she was not happy, whatever. And she uh, she divorced him, and and she. She was very disturbed, like, you know. Did, did she ever understand why the mother kidnapped her and... I don't know, the, all these it's details. It's so difficult, it's so... I don't know. I know of the story. And uh, so many stories I don't remember. That people, uh, children suffered, they were abused also, and so on and so forth. And when you came together as a family, which is so 
unique. Yeah, it's I tell you, really just her life started here, life, uh, very unique, very unique. In Antwerp, we all in Antwerp after the war, some, and, and, and I used to go to school and here and there and work, I used to work in an office, and um, in the beginning especially, I felt very uncomfortable to get together with friends who lost a mother or a father or sisters and brothers. I felt like, <coughs> I felt guilty. I really felt guilty. <coughs> An awful feeling. No, but you lost your grandfather. Your grandfather. Oh was yeah, my thinking. grandfather lost. They put him on a chair and they put him in a truck, and he went to Marlin, and he uh, in Marlin he he met on the train to Auschwitz. He met his youngest son, that came from brain brain dunk, like a torture camp. He looked like a skeleton, and my sister saw that while they were there, and they tried to do something for him. And, he said, the, the, the commander says, we can't do nothing for them. <coughs> so he, they got together, got together the, the father, my grandfather, with his son, the younger son. And they went to Auschwitz and I said in, somewhere, I said, I hope they, yeah, in my story, I hope that they died on the train, they didn't have to go to, you know, he, he was so fragile, my grandfather. My mother heard this when he did it. She, pu she started pulling her hair out, my mother, from, you know, from pain. Oh, this is a, a certificate, it's called the Bescheidigung in German. And, I have to turn around, this was given to me, this is from the Sammelage Mechele, that's where we were. So on the 26th of June 1943, I was liberated <clears throat> with my sisters and my parents. And um, I stayed there. Yeah, no, yeah. On the 26th of June, we were liberated in 43. And then, and then it says, no, we are going to live in Saint-Gilles, Rue Neuchâtel. I don't remember that. That's why, that's why in Brussels, we went to Brussels. And uh, <clears throat> that's the story. And can I ask, I mean, your sisters that were taken back to Mitten, how did they oh, come yeah, out? Oh, that's another, I forgot. <coughs> they, my, my two sisters went back and they got <coughs> transport numbers. <coughs> so one of my sisters, Eva, she, she was finished. She was lying down in the cot and she was ready to die. My brother's sister, Rachel, she was like a little bit more stronger. So she says, you know, the, you know, the Germans used to at night, they used to walk around like a little bit in the court. And they used to go up to the room or whatever. So uh, Eva tells Rachel, you know what you should do? Go down, stand downstairs in the, in the, in the lobby, uh, in the hall, <coughs> lobby, <coughs> and uh, by the door. And when you see him coming, stuck, this guy was, Frank was his name, the German, Frank. He says, uh, tell them that we are here, we are a whole year in this camp. I mean, how, and we're Belgium citizen. How come we got the numbers to, to be shipped away? So she did that. That took a lot of courage to go and address them. And Rachel addressed them and she says, she said what she, you know what I just said. Mm -hmm. And he says, we will tell you in the morning. He says, in German. And you know, and she went up to the to her room, up to the cot, <coughs> and you know, they were like not sleeping, I'm sure, petrified. And in the morning, he came down and he said, "Go, get out." The Germans said, "You know why that happened? Why he let them free? Because at, at that time, June '43, it was already, you know, the Germans knew already that they're not gonna win." So, and because after the war, that Frank, 
he said who worked, you know, who worked with him, who were the big guests, the girls at work, and he and he called them to testify that he was he should be good, that he's good. So my sisters were called to come to testify, but they never went naturally. So this is why they did they let them free. Because they figured, you know, they'll be on his side, on their side. But it saved the lambs. Yeah. Oh. She wasn't going to testify if I against an SS guy. And I mean, how was your reaction when you saw your brothers and your sister, your sisters? Yeah. They must have been very... Very, yeah, very exciting, very... I couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. And did you always remain close with my family? With your siblings and your we are siblings. Yes, yes. I always were close. Everybody was going their own way after a while. And your parents? You were very close. My parents was very close. Special my mother. I was very very close with her. She was a special woman. Everything for her children. Nothing for herself. And. Uh, <clears throat> She uh, had a hard life also because she lost two children. I didn't even tell you that. In 19, I had a bra I had twin. The, the Abraham the twin was a twin, and they had the next in um, a, a epidemic from diphtheria at the time in in, in the beginning 1900s, and he was born in 19. Uh, uh, no, uh, he was born in 1915, but before him, in 1913, a girl was born, Sarah, and she died at 18 months from a diphtheria. Then she had the twins, Abraham and Joseph, not Abraham, Abraham and Saul. Abraham survived and Saul also got, got killed from diphtheria. Mm -hmm. So she lost two kids, can you imagine? And were they always positive, your parents? I was, my mother was 45 when I was born. So by the time I knew what a mother was, mm -hmm. she was already 50 at least, 55. I never had a young mother. She used to come to school, you know, sometimes I was so embarrassed, like a grandmother coming <laughs> to school. So, um, you asked me the question about if we were close, yeah, very close. And then after she passed away, why didn't I ask her questions about her youth, but not enough? She used to tell me a little bit, she used to like to go dancing, uh, Troika, you know, with four girls, three girls like this, those dancers, she used to like to do that. She used to like to sing, she used to sing in the house, and uh, she was a very good person. And now we can ask, after the war, did you speak to your parents about what had happened during the war? Could you speak about...? No, not much. We didn't talk much. And Maybe we did. I don't remember that. And when did you really first hear about the camps and what had happened in the... In Germany. In Germany, in Auschwitz? Yeah, we had a lot of... I had lost aunts and uncles and cousins and, <coughs> and friends. And uh, my grandfather, my grandmother, uh, yeah. awful. a lot of people from my family died. I have four books from Merkelberg, four books that tells you the whole story. Each person is in there. If you'd like to see it, I could show you. And have you ever gone back? Did you ever go back to, to the... Merkelberg? Yeah, I've seen them. I've seen they, they made a, a beautiful apartments they made there from the camp. They destroyed everything and they built apartments with flowers, Mechelbe. And then they made they made a museum across the street. They had a house in the middle. But the problem was at the time they should have bought this building and make a museum out of it, like you know. But they, nobody had money. I don't know. People didn't put money in there, so this was given to the city, whatever. It was actually a caserne, but you know what a caserne is? It's a, a, for soldiers used to stay there. And when you went back, was it difficult to go back? Was it? Yeah, it was. There was a plaque there on the, on the building. It just it was difficult to see what they did. 
people, you know, non truths live there like nothing. And like when we walked in there, we tried to see the rooms that we were in. It's all built over, built over. Yeah, nothing left really to see what it looked like. There's pictures, the courtyard you could see. And can I ask, Nami, when you, when your parents decided to go to America? Oh no, they never came to America. They never came. No, no, no. My mother, <coughs> my mother died in Belgium um, in the nineteen fifty. 1950, 1949, and my fa father went to Israel, and I came to America. What year did you come to America? 51, after my mother passed away. Do you remember in 48 when the state was established? Yeah, absolutely, yes. I have a picture from my brother coming jumping off the the, tr the boat from from a you have a picture of your brother I, I know there's a picture and i have this picture somewhere how he comes out with a with a tank now if, from uh, normandy he came with normandy off these boats into from the war from the sea he came into belgium and then they came to brussels on tanks to liberate brussels and there he's standing on top of the tank like this, and all the and all the people are around around there, and and you know it's like such a such a jubilation of of happiness. And do you remember when when the war ended that day? Do you remember that particular day? I was in the home. Yeah, nothing. We were all very very happy, but you know everybody was concerned about their own was their own lives, their own parents, their own siblings. Um, we, I mean, I'm telling you, we were like, I was embarrassed that we all survived. It's a terrible thing to do, to feel that way, but that's how it was. Because there are many families that, that, that your family survived intact is... is what? It's very unusual, unusual. and very, un, very unique. Very unusual. But we were spread all over, you know. Uh, my fa my parents took a smuggler for him, for David to end up in Cuba. He had his own story, but uh, so the 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 the, um, the smuggler took the money and didn't pass. Let him stand there. Can you imagine? And uh, I don't know where that money came from. And then they took another a smuggler, and that's the time he went through. He went to Marseille. He went all over, and he ended up in Cuba. And then we, what, what made you decide? I had, some, the, uh, I had a few uncles, from, uh, brothers from my mother, that were very supportive, uh, that were helping money-wise, uh, and also visa-wise for my brother. As a matter of fact, visa-wise for me coming to the States. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. What made you decide to go to America? Well, I had, uh, my sister, she, she was, got married after the war, and, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, then the Korean War started, and they, her, his family, her husband's family, decided to leave Belgium. They wanted to go to America. So she went with them. She had a baby, little girl, two years old, and she and his family went to America before, just before I came. Now, I was, I, all of a sudden, my mother had passed away, and my father went, wanted to go to Israel. I should have gone with my father to Israel because he, he, he went by himself. I mean, he had, I had brothers there already, three brothers, so he went to them. Uh, but uh, I wanted to go, my, I was very close to my sister, the one who went to the States. <coughs> so she kept on writing to me, you should come here and this and that, and it, it's a new life and it's wonderful, and, and uh, you know, what you have you going to do in Antwerp? And I was pretty miserable there, and. Uh, so I decided to go to her. And you went by yourself? I went by myself, yeah, on the boat. Queen, Ma Queen, Ma Queen Mary, I think, yeah, Queen, Queen Mary. Yeah. And I was sick for five days, took five days to trip. I was sick from the boat. And the last day, everybody felt better. And then you saw the uh, Statue of Liberty. 
<laughs> and my, and my, she, my came sister, to she came, Boston. yeah, she came, and the family, I, mean, I had some uncles and cousins, and she made a party in her house, and uh, which was very interesting. Before I came to America, she had told me that she lives in a building, and in that building, there's a family that she got very friendly with, and they have a brother, a single brother, and he's, uh, and they're very nice people, and so on and so forth. And when she said single brother, and we lives with them, so I said, hmm, maybe that's the guy I'm going to marry, and I did. Wow. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's sure, that's incredible. Yeah, <laughs> incredible, yeah. And did, by this time, did you know any English, or did you? Well, to... I didn't speak English much. I heard a few words. I, I learned fast. Well, then I started going out with this guy. I went out with many guys, many guys, quite a few. I was ready to get married because I wanted to get out of my sister's house. And um, so, uh, anyway, so this is what happened. Wow. And can I ask, Naomi, with you and your family and your kids, did you <laughs> ever speak about your, your experiences? You go where? Did you speak to your kids about what had happened to you during the war? Oh yes, or? yes, yes. They know my story. All my kids. When they were growing up, or did yeah. you speak? No, no. When they were growing up, they have it up to here. But they were traumatized by it. Maybe, maybe they are. I think if you talk to my son, to Stephen, he says, "Yeah, I'm a second uh, generation." Generation. I think they all were. Dramatized. I mean, they all know my story and they all felt for me. My, my husband couldn't hear the story because he was never in the Holocaust. He, he was, it hurt him so much to listen to what I had to tell him. And did you mix with a lot of friends of yours that were also that came from Europe when you were in America? Or did you yeah. make a lot of American friends as well? I'm, I am no. I, I was in touch with a lot of Ameri with a lot of Belgian people. As a matter of fact, till today, my friends are usually from Belgium. I have a lot of friends from Belgium today, which I didn't know then, but I met them here also. And are you happy that you came to Israel? Yeah, yeah. Except this. Uh, That's happening. A terrible situation now. So now, I mean, if I can ask you, because you've been through so much and you've seen so much. What message do you give to your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren, and to the future generations? What I tell them? What message? A message, the message I tell them. There should be mention, should be a mensch. You should, you should be humble, no matter how high you get, how important your situation is in the world, you should be humble. It shouldn't go to your head that you know, you could do everything. We're all humans, and we all uh, have our shortcomings and our capacities, and you have to accept people the way they are, and be and love them, and be good, and you should be good, you should do good deeds, and you should love your children, and your grandchildren, and your children, and you should love everybody. You should spread love in a good way. It's a lovely message. Okay. I mean, and uh, I just want to really thank you. I'm so grateful to you. If I can <coughs> we'll go through these pictures, but yeah. Let me. F I oh. just want to thank you so much. Yeah. Let me really. It's been such an honor and a privilege to be here. And from the bottom of my heart, I'm so grateful to you. Yeah. You are an inspiration to all of us. Yeah. Maybe you, you so? are. You are amazing, and you should just have muzzle brocha muzzle. and. And Thank all you. of Hashem's blessings yeah. at Mavis Room in good health amen, and continue amen. inspiring all of us. Well, that this was very inspirational, that little video I made. I mean, it went viral. It's wonderful. It's incredible. So, Mommy, if you could show us a few of the pictures. Oh, the pictures. What you have in your hand? Oh. What I have in my hand, this is a little stone, the shape of a heart, that I found in Mechelen, in the court. I found this. So I took, there was one uh, uh, artist there, and he painted the, the front of the caserne, of the, uh, of the caserne, that's called the caserne de Saint. And in the back, 
It's when I got in there, January 7th, 1943, and I got out June 27, 43. I was there for six months. This is like a little a souvenir. I don't know who is going to take it after I'm gone. It's, it's, well, that's many years to come. <laughs> <laughs> now you must keep it in the family. Yeah, sure. Yeah, my kids will learn. Here, this is, this is the home where I was at. Oh, here's a picture from my parents after the war. Right after the war. This is your parents after the war? Yeah. And you with your parents? What? You were... This is you as well with your parents? Yeah, that's me. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's me. In 1945. It's very special, man. And this picture was was taken from an American soldier oh, who came to Belgium, and he was sent by by my uncle, by my by my mother's brother, to take a picture from us. And this is in the home, for the children's home. And the girl sitting at the table and eating. And are you in the picture? Yeah, yeah. Where are you? I, I told you, maybe you could find me now. <laughs> Here, the second one. I'm like biting oh. into my... I'm making a mossy maybe. <laughs> And then this is another picture with your... Yeah, after the war. This is after the war with your parents? No. Your brother, your yeah, brother's brother, there and mother. your mother. Your brother and your mother. <laughs> oh, this is the three sisters. For before Pesach, my mother had made the, the dresses for us for Pesach. Your mother made these dresses? No, she had a maid. She had a maid. She knew how to sew, but she didn't make these dresses. I remember, I even remember, it was when we were so, oh my God, new dress. It was like special, you know? Not like today. Uh, I, this is the, so that's also the home where we stayed. This is in the effect where we had, uh, where we ate, boys and girls together. And Nami, are you in, in touch with any of the, of the children from the home? Unfortunately, they all passed away. Mm. I wasn't in touch with them. I mean, not with all of them, but with mm. some of them. The, the group of girls that we were all together, <coughs> they all died. This is, this is in the home where it was like a castle in the outskirts from the city. That's where we were. And this is, this is in Brussels? Yeah, out of Brussels, out from Brussels. And does it still exist today? Yeah, I went to see it with my son many years ago. And he was still standing there, dilapidated. And here also. So we were lucky to be there. It was actually nice. You know, if you look at these pictures, you people are people are looking. They're smiling and they yeah. seem quite happy. It's yeah. Under such difficult circumstances and. Well, the home. You know, we had uh, different things going on, and we. Uh, the, there was like a field there. The 
boys were working in the field. We had carrots, we had apple, apples growing, we had applesauce for, for breakfast from the trees, from the apple trees. And uh, it was like well run, well run. We had to get up in the morning and make exercise. Um, so, oh, wait a minute. This is, this is a, you know, I'm going show you. Here, this is before the war. I was like five, six years old here with my, my, my cousin and my sisters. We were, always went to the country for vacation. Oh, this is a postcard from my brother from Germany. We sent this to me. I was by Tiefenbrunner at the time. You see the address Rue des Patriotes? Do you know that? Is it the name of the place? No. I guess you don't know. You must have been very, very excited to get this postcard. Yeah, yeah. See, from, from Germany, Internierungspost. Joseph Isbutsky, his number is, is civilian, English civilian internee. Uh, what is it? But I see only one minute. Oh, and here's the, what he writes. Yeah. In 1944. <sighs> I don't know what language it is. And, and Nami, what language did you speak with your parents? In? Yiddish. My parents Yiddish, and with my siblings French, Flemish, a little English, a little bit. This is in Flemish. My kids don't read this. And I, uh, I made inquiries about Yad Vashem. I have so many, I have so many letters between us. So they, say, they told me that they just put it in a drawer and they don't do this film, they have so much. You must keep it within the family. Yeah, I think that's what I'll do. I know one of my sons is like very much interested and in keep it in the family, absolutely. Here, this is, this is uh, in 1991 when we had this gathering from the Hidden Children. So that's here, that's me on the committee. And this, this girl, she was a friend of mine that we were in the home. And, she, and they met one of the guys that was in the home. They didn't see each other for a long time. I have more and more. So, I mean, this is a picture of your aunt, my aunt. <coughs> and she was deported. Tante Raya. She was deported. And this is her daughter, also deported. What was her name? Hmm? What is Sophie. Sophie, Sophie Dimmelstein. And this is my aunt when she was, oh, that's the father. He's the one who met his, his father. He, he looked like a skeleton, Noah Dimmelstein. And they were on the train together. That's his wife with a baby. They had two daughters. The two daughters also were deported. The whole family. She, she was, the mother was hiding in a convent and her daughter was by a non-Jewish uh, family that used to work for them, whatever. So they were both sides. So one day she couldn't wait to see her daughter. She, she left the convent and she was followed by Gestapo of, you know, of Belgium. And, and, they, and, and she went to see her daughter. And 
They got the daughter and the mother together and sent them to Auschwitz. It was horrible. A pretty horrible story. I, you know what? I'm sitting here and thinking what's going on here. We had a Holocaust here. This is so unbelievable and it, it hit me harder than the Holocaust I was in. Because I was young, I didn't realize the severity of it. And here I am faced right in front of me. It's just, I don't know. This is a guy I met at the uh, assembly, at the, at the uh, hidden children there, at the, in the married marquee. They were putting all kinds of, uh, you know, of um, notes on the on the board with pictures, and people walked by and they recognized each other. Kids out of Harding. But, but so how many years is this from? From 45 till 91, that's how many years? It's maybe just under 50 years. Yeah. yeah. And this is, a, uh, I told my story to a Christian school in Belgium. See me sitting there in the front? And how did they react when you spoke to them? Them? Were they very positive? They, uh, they sent me a report from one of the students. They made a whole report about it. I mean, I don't know how they felt. I didn't discuss it with them. I just told my story. And you, you, know spoke, I mean? in, you spoke in Flemish? In Flemish, yeah. <laughs> I can't find this paper with my uh, Mozi. I mean, I have more and more. And this is the speech I made to bring forth bread is at the uh, gathering at the and this and the Mosi at the dinner. Nineteen ninety one from yeah. uh, and this was published in This is a magazine from Amit. 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 Oh Nomi, can I ask you a favor? Could you read it because it's so okay. special. <coughs> you have time for this? Absolutely sure. Where's my glasses? Oh here. I could read without it, but it's easy with. It's very special. Who brings forth bread? The following invocation was delivered at the dinner during the gathering of hidden children. My name is Naomi Waldman. I live in Forest Hills, New York. I was born in Antwerp, Belgium, and I was hidden. I was a hidden child in World War II. <coughs> when Rachel Berman, one of the women on the committee, um, asked me if I would like to say the mozi, the blessing on, on bread, to start the dinner tonight. She had no idea whatsoever of the memories it triggered in my mind. Before the Germans invaded Belgium on May 18, 1940, my family tried to escape by going to La Panne, a town near, a town near the seashore by the French border. The night before the Germans marched in, heavy bombing was expected and people were looking to sh for shelter. My mother, one of my older brothers, my two sisters and I decided to go to the basement of a nearby church. My father, who was a very orthodox man, refused to go and felt that, and felt that God would protect him wherever he was. He stayed in the apartment and we rent, and, uh, that we rented previously. As, as, night, as night fell and hundreds of people huddled together in the church basement, the bombs started falling and even though I was very young, I remember vividly seeing through the large windows huge masses of flame zooming by with ferocious explosions uh, shattering glass windows all around us. The end seemed very close. I was extremely frightened and terribly and trembled greatly. And while my brother was saying to Hillen by heart, um, I repeated fervently over and over the only prayer that came to my mind, Amorzi lechem in 
Blessed art thou, O God, King of the universe, who brings bread forth from the ground. The church had two steeples. One was bound to the ground, the other closer to where we were hidden was untouched and miraculously we all survived, as did my father. During the Persian Gulf, I spoke daily with my children who live in Israel, and I told my little granddaughter Leah, who, heard, who had heard about my war experiences before, not to be afraid when she had to go to the Chederatum, the sealed room, with her gas masks. Just keep on saying Amotzi Lechem in Aris. <laughs> she reacted by saying, but Bobby, I know so many more book prayers. Now, 50 years later, from that frightening night, I am staying here at the first international gathering of hidden children, saying the Motsi. Our sages point out that the miracle of bread is a symbol of life. A seed is planted in the earth, though it's hidden as part of my family was hidden in the basement of a church, as we are hidden in an abandoned house, and as we were hidden in an attic, as all of you were hidden in some way or another, though it is, it is, it, though it is hidden in the earth, the seed is nourished and one day emerges into the sun. The story of the grain of wheat is our story. It is the story of the Jewish people who have again risen from the ashes to rebuild themselves in Israel and all over the world. All of us here surely feel that it is time for the hidden children to, to emerge. Would you please join me in saying the blessing? Baruch atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech Haolam Amen. Amen.